Uh, how many people are using image data for your work? Okay, so 30%. So I'm, I'm assuming the other 70% are not using image data. Right, so there's, there's many different ways you can categorize the data that you use. You can have kind of nu just numeric tabular data, so something that you get in a spreadsheet. You can have sensor data, so time series data, data that is not images, and then image data, and that, that's what Roy spent the last couple of hours talking about. Now, my focus today is going to be on the sensor data, everything except images, but a lot of the concepts that Roy showed will actually be usable, and I'll demo how you can use the same image concepts for sensor data. So before I get started, there's, there's really two ways to process sensor data that's not images. The first way, this is actually the most common way, is to convert your signal time series data into some sort of image representation. Convert it into a 2D matrix, and then you can use a CNN. So all the techniques that Roy showed are actually usable for non-image data, and I'll show you how to do that. And secondly, you can use uh, a certain kind of deep learning uh, called LSTM, which is a type of recurrent neural network uh, that is designed to handle sequence data, especially when you have kind of long-term dependencies uh, in the data. So I'm going to show three examples. I'm going to try and get you out in time for lunch. Uh, the first one will deal with point cloud data. So these are 3D LiDAR data. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the, the exact data in a minute. Uh, we'll deal with some ECG data. So this, again, is continuous signal data. We'll try and classify different heart sounds uh, to figure out whether there's uh, someone in danger of cardiac failure or if they have arrhythmia. And lastly, we'll actually deal with the data from a cell phone. So the accelerometer and gyroscope from a cell phone. And I'll show you lots, like a few different techniques uh, to process each of these things. Right, so the first example is the 3D point cloud data. And in this case, what we want to do is we want to assign a label, kind of like semantic segmentation, but we want to assign the label to every single pixel or every single point in the 3D data. Okay, so Okay, so let's first take a look at kind of what does, what does LiDAR data look like so we can get a sense of what we're going to be processing. Okay, so you see the ground truth label or app that Roy showed. I'm actually just, in this case, I'm connecting it to the LiDAR data uh, just so you can see it side by side with the video. If you look at it by itself, it's actually hard to get a sense of what you're seeing. So let me move this. Right, so you can see here, you can see the three cars that are in front. You can see these circles, and that's the LiDAR, the laser actually bouncing off the ground and back to the sensor. And if you look at it this way, you can see the, the height of the trees. Right, so that's, that's what LiDAR data looks like. When we actually process it next, we are going to use uh, just the LiDAR data and not... Uh, not any of the video data. So we're just going to process the XYZ values of this point cloud. Okay, so let's, let's first kind of take a look at what that point cloud data looks like. So let me do... So you'll, s you'll see it's a point, point cloud object, and you have 47,000 points uh, in the point cloud. And you can actually display that, so let me... Okay. 
right? So there's, there's the point cloud. So before we do any deep learning, we actually need to clean up this point cloud because there's too much data here. Uh, before I can label it to figure out how to actually segment it, I need to remove some of the noise. And then I also need to cluster objects because I can't go in and label every single point in the 3D. Right? So the first thing I need to do is actually remove the effect of the ground. Uh, and then I need to cluster the objects before I can label them, uh, just, just to save time so I don't have to label every single point in the data. So now this is going to be the case anytime you process data that is not images or signal data, even images, uh, that there's probably some signal processing technique that you already use or you're familiar with that you can use to prepare your data for the deep learning. So now in this case, there's actually an example in MATLAB that shows you kind of how to do the pre-processing. I'm, I'm not going to walk over this in too much detail, but that starts from the same raw point cloud and arrives at a segmentation. And once you have the segmentation, the way it does the segmentation is it actually finds a plane, uh, and that's usually the ground. So it fits a geometric model to the points and it finds the ego vehicle, and then it finds all the obstacles. So I'm able to cluster each of those points. Uh, but after that, I actually need to label it before I can do any, it's supervised learning. And before I do any supervised learning, I actually need labels. So let me just run this. Okay, so this is kind of a simple tool that we've built just are using the existing MATLAB LiDAR tools. Right, you'll see the effect of the ground has been re uh, removed, and you'll also see the points have been clustered. Right, so you can see you have a cluster here, you have a blue cluster, gl green cluster. I have two labels, car and other, but let me do plus. And you can see the box will automatically pivot to the clusters. So I can label car. I can go label the next frame, and I can keep going. Right. Now, if you have lots of time, maybe some students from the university, you can probably go and label frame by frame by frame, right? But I don't think any engineer has ever thought that, okay, I want to go into work and I want to label my data. So one of the key things that you can do when you have signal data or any data with MATLAB is actually automate the labeling. In this case, what I did is we put a simple tracking algorithm in the back end. You click start tracking. Next, actually, let me just play it. And now this is automatically using the tracking algorithm to label the car from frame to frame to frame. This is uh, very much the same algorithm that was used with the image data to track from frame to frame, except here we're using it with the 3D point cloud data. All right, so now to solve this problem, I actually labeled, I had about four sequences of data and we labeled it kind of ahead of time. So you can see this is one of the pre-labeled sequences. You can, you have multiple cars. We actually had trucks in the sequence as well. But in this case, my data is still available only as these 3D points plus the bounding boxes around the 3D points. And from that, I can actually infer what the individual points are labeled as, right? So my next, the next thing for me to do is actually to prepare the data. Now this data preparation step is one of the most crucial steps because here's where you take the data and you can either convert it into an image representation, which is what I'm gonna do in a second, or uh, filter it so it's easier to use deep, uh, to use deep learning. And I'll, I'll show, you, show you that in pretty much every of these examples. So if I open this prepare segmentation data, 
This is, this is what this is doing. Uh, now this data comes from a Velodyne LiDAR, so there's actually a Velodyne file reader available in MATLAB. And it goes into the data, each sequence, and it actually converts the each line of the spinning point cloud into a row of the image. So that's a little bit easier to show on a slide. So you have the raw point cloud data, and if you actually reorder the rows, and then you superimpose the labels from the ground truth label, you can get labeled images. And these look a lot like the labeled images for the semantic segmentation that Roy just showed, right? So we've taken the 3D point cloud, we've labeled it, we've used some signal processing technique uh, to pre-process, but now what we have before we do any sort of deep learning actually is just sets of labeled images. And when you have a set of labeled images, you can use any of the CNN techniques that we've, that, that Roy showed before. Uh, let me show you which one I, I'm going to use. Right, so, so this is actually what that labeled, the that image looks like. This is what we're going to feed to the network. And once we have some results, we'll actually transform it back up to the point cloud and we'll see what that looks like. So now that all our training data actually is basically just in the image format, uh, you can see we're using the same image data store that manages kind of the large set of images. The pixel label data store is a way to manage the pixel labels because for every image that you have, you have a corresponding pixel label and that's the label mask that I showed. Right. You split again 7030 into training and testing. And then you can use the same image based techniques. I'm not going to run this because this network actually took several hours to train. Uh, and everybody probably wants to get to lunch, right? But let me, let me actually show you the output. So this is one interpretation of the output where you took, we took, I took the point cloud and we are classifying individual, uh, individual clusters in the point cloud and then we're dr drawing the box around the cars. Uh, but the actual raw output of this is this. So you can see we've classified the ground in the green, you've classified the, the pixels that are on the car in red, and everything else is basically the other class. Uh, so some certain points that are unclassifiable, it actually puts us blue. Right. So in this case, kind of the workflow is you start with the 3D data, you label it, transform it down to a 2D representation, use an image based technique and then transform that back up to the back up to the 3D data and what this lets us do is that one it lets me use all my existing signal processing techniques that i had for the point clouds and it also lets me leverage kind of the big base of research that uses images for deep learning So when you look at this very simplistic example, you'll find this, when you're using deep learning with sensor data, you'll find that the data preparation and the pre-processing is very, very crucial because you have to take the data and put it in some sort of usable format uh, for deep learning, whether you're using uh, image-based CNN or some other technique. And one of the things that, uh, if you've used MATLAB for, for, for a while, you probably have MATLAB code that is used to process that data already, uh, and you can really save time by using your existing signal processing tools. Right, the other thing that you'll find, So, so the, qu the question is, do you lose data when you convert from 3D to 2D? 
So in this case, you don't actually lose any data because you, you take all of those points and convert them. Every point in the 3D, remember it's a sparse 3D representation. It's not a dense 3D representation. So every point in the 3D actually has a corresponding point in the 2D. You, you you have you have three different two D images, and that's what they have. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you'll probably find is uh, either the parameter selection for the deep learning, and I'll show you how to automate that in a second. All the ground truth labeling can be very very manual and painful, uh, but but. Thankfully, MATLAB actually has lots of automations, both for parameter selection and for your ground truth labeling, that will save you quite a bit of time. All right, so let me, let me show you another example. Uh, this is using very different data, and hopefully what you'll see by the end of the session is just a few different techniques to process different kinds of sensor data uh, using deep learning. Okay, so let me start by loading the data. And actually, let's explore the data. Now, we, we have a new, new app in MATLAB that is actually very, very good for exploring signal data. So even if you just have signals that you want to explore, the Signal Analyzer app is a very, very good way to do it. So you have, these are from two of the classes, Normal and Arrhythmia. And if you look at this in the time domain, they actually look very similar, right? It's hard visually looking at it to tell the difference between these two signals, right? Uh, you, can, you, can, you can look at the spectrum, you can do some sort of time frequency analysis. Let me do the same here. But it's still pretty hard to tell the difference between the normal sam sample and the arrhythmia, right? Uh, there's, there's a little bit of difference in the arrhythmia in the frequency. It's not quite as uh, periodic, but it's still hard to tell. Right? So if... No, no. The, these are just a sampling of the data set. I have thousands of samples. So in this case, if you take a simple spectrogram and you have a normal, just a normal heartbeat and arrhythmia, one, you notice while going to the spectrogram, you lose a lot of, lot of information. And if you compare the two signals, there's very little discriminating between the two. But MATLAB has done signal processing for 30 years. There's a big library of other techniques available in MATLAB. So the one technique that, that we have found and the community has found that is very, very effective in converting from uh, a 1D signal to an image representation is a, is a wavelet, a CWT wavelet transform. And if you look at the wavelet transform, which is what I have here for the normal, you'll see the peaks are well defined. And if you look at the arrhythmia, you'll also see the peaks are well defined. But you'll also see, start to see some differences. You'll, so you'll see in the bottom here, when there's an arrhythmia, there's a lot more activity going on here than there is here for the normal signal, right? So here now you can tell that, okay, if I feed this to a learning algorithm, I can actually be able to tell the difference between these two. Right, so in this case, we, we use the CWT function. This is part of the Wavelet toolbox. Uh, the CWT function just gives us this plot automatically. If you want to kind of create this plot for a large set of data for efficiency, you actually need to create a filter bank. And that, while calling every subsequent CWT, is actually much more efficient. 
So in this case, you create the filter bank, and then you use the filter bank to give you the wavelet transform, uh, and that's a much more efficient way computationally to do it. Now, again, we're going to follow a very similar approach as last time, where we're going to take the signal, and we're going to convert it into an image. So the way, way we do that is we load the data in the math file. We create a folder if it doesn't exist. And we go through the entire folder. We create the time frequency transform, which, uh, which in this case is the CWT, which will look, look like this. And then we save the figure. Right? So it's a very crude way of converting from a 1D signal to 2D. Uh, and you do lose some data, but you're still keeping some of that discriminative information. So at this time, I have a set of images. I want to train a CNN. Does anyone have an idea of the best way to start? Do you think one of the transfer learning techniques that Roy showed with, say, AlexNet, it can recognize 1,000 classes of objects? Will that work? How many, how many think that will work? Uh, four, maybe five people. OK? So we have, we have a network that can recognize keyboard, mice, water bottle. And we have data that looks like this. Right? But we're actually going to, we're going to try using AlexNet. Right? So we're going to take the training data. We're going to split it into training and test, 80%, 80-20. Then we're going to take AlexNet, and we're just going to change the last two layers to three class, which is normal, arrhythmia, and uh, whether it's going into heart failure. Uh, whether it's going, to fa going into failure or not. Right? And we train AlexNet. Right? Now, I'm not going to train the network here. This took a pretty significant amount of time to train. Let me, I can show you. So this was running on a very new generation desktop GPU, and it took a few minutes to train. Right, so in the entire room, there were five people that thought training AlexNet would work. So what does any, someone think the accuracy was of classifying, distinguishing between those three classes of objects? 20%? 50? One, 100 is a stretch. But on the, on the, training, da on the training data, we actually got an accuracy of over 100%, uh, oh, sorry, over 90%, not over 100 that, that would be a bit much, uh, right? Using AlexNet, which was trained on just completely different images, and that is one of the, the power of deep learning, is if you can prepare your data and you can transform it into a form that a standard network understands, with almost no feature engineering, with very, very crude conversion to 2D, you can get highly accurate results. Now, you, you know your domain. You can probably do more sophisticated signal processing than what I did, and you can get even better results. Mm -hmm. Again, in the high 90s. It, it generalizes shockingly well. Uh, and how do you know how to choose the wavelet? I mean, you're training the data on some uh, vector base. It should be arbitrary. Why you choose one instead of another? So in, in this particular case, we had some prior knowledge of the domain. So this is where the prior knowledge of the domain actually helps. Uh, this data had been used in some signal processing challenges, so we, 
that we had worked on, so we knew that converting to a wavelet gives us pretty discriminative information. The original spectrogram, or? So then you need to use an LSTM or something that actually takes a sequence input. And I'll get to that in the next example. You can, you, you can do it, I'll. Why convert it to a spectrogram? I, I think you need the spectrogram to be able to look at the, the counts of prime and counts of mean. The, the original data. And fit it to the LSTM. To, to an LSTM. To the original data is in 1D over time. It's not 2D. You could. We we I haven't tried that. We have, we haven't I haven't tried it. You can try it. I mean maybe it'll work as well. Mm -hmm. So we're not going back. We're going from a vector to a matrix to a label. We're not going back to the signal. You feed a 2D matrix. You feed an image to AlexNet. You don't feed the vector. You feed a matrix. You feed a 2D matrix. You, you don't feed a 1D. To a CNN, you feed a 2D matrix. The, the, the convolution, it's a, it's a, it's, they're all 2D convolution, so the input is always 2D for CNN. I, I can show you the structure afterwards, but some questions there? Yes. You, or some other... Yes. 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 And uh, the wavelets in the in the community now are becoming quite popular again, just because it forms a pretty discriminative uh, time frequency representation. All right. So similar to. The last example, in this case, really all that I needed for getting very high 90 plus percent accuracy was to prep, prep my data to take the, the, the 1D signal, convert it to a 2D time series representation, and then feed that directly to a network. So, so far everything I've shown you almost, it seems like cheating, right? We're taking the 1D, 1D signal. We're transforming it into 2D and just using an image-based technique. Uh, actually, in the community, that is found to be very, very effective. And uh, certain uh, speaker recognition, speaker identification tasks uh, are actually s successfully solved in industry using a CNN approach. Uh, but for the next, next approach, I'm going to use kind of a different deep learning technique that's available in MATLAB. And that's called an LSTM, or a long and short term memory. Now an LSTM, is a, it's a recurrent network, which basically, if you split up, is a series of many of these cells. This is actually very similar uh, to the old feed-forward <coughs> networks. And what an LSTM is very, very good for, is it's very good for a uh, time series signal when there are uh, relationships uh, over time. So for example, if you take the sentence, I live in France, I speak. And if the network has to predict, the network needs context from earlier where it says I live in France, so I speak French. Right. 
So and an LSTM also is designed to feed in time series sequence data, so you don't have to transform it to a 2D, 2D representation. Right, so the problem that we're gonna solve in this case is we're gonna take the data that's captured off a cell phone, and we're going to try and classify what activity based on the accelerometer and gyroscope data, what activity is actually happening. Are they walking upstairs, downstairs, standing, sitting, lying down? Okay. The accelerometer and the gyroscope. Okay, so, so in this case, again, we have nine channels of data from the accelerometer and gyroscope. Uh, and if you look at the signals from the data from one of the channels, uh, these are the six different classes that we have. Walking, walking upstairs, downstairs, sitting, standing, and lying down, right? And if you look at the data by itself, you'll notice that it is very, very difficult to separate sitting, standing, and lying down from each other, and very difficult to separate walking and the walking upstairs and downstairs. Right? The signals look very, very, very similar. There's not much discriminative information. Right, so let's actually let's actually plot that. And you'll see this is what the training data looks like. So in this case, this no, this is the signal from the accelerometer and gyroscope on a cell phone, right? So there's nine channels of data, uh, but yeah, it's just one D one D data over time, sampled at like for. 128 seconds. Right, so this is what the signal data looks like for one series of activities. So you can see the subject is going from lying down, sitting, walking, walking upstairs, walking downstairs. Right. And you'll see over time the acceleration in the x direction. Now, the data as we, we get it actually comes, uh, is sampled with some overlap. So we do some signal processing to remove the overlap so we don't have any redundant data, just, just very s simple sampling. And that gives us data that is uh, uh, 64, 64 elements wide per sample. Right, and then we can we prepare it into training and test data. Let's just take a look at what that data looks like so you can get a sense of what we're feeding uh, for the training. Right, so. So this is what the training data looks like. So nine, nine corresponds to each of the channels of the data. And then you have 64 time steps for each channel. And then there's a label pre-assigned to each channel for one of those six classes, standing, lying down, walking upstairs, walking downstairs. Right, but in this case, we're not, we are not transforming it in any form. We're not filtering it. The only thing we've done is remove the overlaps so that there's no redundant data. Uh, but we're gonna feed the nine channels of data as is, as in, uh, uh, to the deep learning network. Right, so we'll do follow the usual practice, split AT20 into training and test. And now it's time to actually
Roy, how do you zoom? I don't know how you increase the text size. You just open it again. Uh, sorry, technical difficulties. No, no, it's, it's reduced the font size. Okay, sorry, we're having some technical issues, but let me... Okay, so... So in, in the case of the LSTMs, actually constructing the networks are much, much, much simpler. Uh, we s the input to an LSTM, so the input to a CNN in MATLAB is an image input layer. You have a sequence input layer that takes a series of 1D sequences. In this case, it takes the nine 1D sequences. You have an LS LSTM layer, so that one LSTM layer is one recurrent network. Uh, and then you have a fully connected layer and a classification layer. This recurrent network actually has 100 hidden layers, very similar to just traditional neural networks. So those are 100 of those individual uh, layers. Now the two, two variables that you can change uh, to, to tweak it, to get depth in the network, you can add more LSTM layers. The other thing is if you want to uh, change how local the information uh, the network is learning, you can either increase or reduce the, the number of hidden layers that you have. Right, again, split into, split into training and test. Right, and actually in this case, if you, if you take the default training options, you get just 57% accuracy, right? So, good, good, it's predicting whether it's walking, standing, so it compares, you get a 57% accuracy of com comparing the predicted network, uh, predicted output versus the actual output. So the actual signals were labeled when, like, uh, ahead of time. Uh, Not the next, the current no. signal. The next, uh, no, good question. So the question is, did the network predict the, uh, in real time, no, it takes a, takes a chunk of time and then it predicts what the activity is for that chunk of time. So it takes a 2.5 second uh, sample and then it predicts what the activity for that sample and takes another 2.5 second sample and predicts that. Good question. No, we actually use all, all nine, nine channels. The, what was the, question? the question is do you use just one channel or do you use all nine? So. No, we use you, we use all nine channels. When you uh, when you create the se sequence input layer, you can pass as many channels as you want into it. So very often, if you have complex data, uh, what what you do is you take the real part and the imaginary part and pass them in as two different sequences. So there's a question back there. Uh, Yes, you do, right? So you have the sequences. The, the correlation between them is, is mapped both in the LSTM, and towards the end when you have a fully connected layer, the correlation is mapped even there. 
So the interplay, with the channels are not treated independently. Okay, uh, so so currently in MATLAB there are no tools like that. Now, if you use the previous techniques that I showed, yeah. you can uh, you can you can do that already. Uh, currently, for the, in the signal space, there aren't. Uh, Knowing the classes in advance, yep. Yeah. Right, so in, in this case, we got absolutely horrible, horrible accuracy, right? 50, 52 percent, uh, almost no discrimination, just slightly better than random. So the multiple ways you can Im improve this, you can change the network architecture and try again. But the thing that we usually ask, ask everyone to do first is change your training parameters, see what works. Now, if you have a lot of time or a lot of expertise, you can actually uh, use some of that in insight to train the training uh, change the training parameters. But there are automations available that will make this uh, much easier. One such automation is Bayes Bayesian optimization. So previously, we used to recommend that you use grid search, where you have a grid of the different options, and you, you do a brute force pass through the grid. What Bayes opt Bay Bayesian optimization does is it lets you create an objective function, and then you minimize the lo loss of that objective function. It's, it's a little easier to look at it in 2D because uh, there are six training parameters that in this case that we optimize for. Uh, but in 2D, if you look at just optimizing for the initial learning rate and the mini batch size, if you look here, you can see kind of the cross, which is the, the lowest uh, loss of that objective function. So what Bayes Bayesian optimization does is it tries these different options of the different, different training parameters. Uh, and it'll run the training. So it actually, this can take, a this can take quite a bit of time, uh, but it is a faster way, significantly faster than if you did a grid search or a binary search uh, to find, uh, it won't give you the optimal value, but it'll give you a much better starting point than if you just start with the defaults. Right, so in this case, the variables that we're optimizing are the basically what you feed into the training options. So momentum, learning rate, uh, mini batch size. Usually uh, when we work with customers, we usually tell them that if you have no time, the first thing to modify is the learning rate. Because very, very often what happens is if your learning rate is, uh, is too large, you you just don't, don't, don't reach the right answer, it finishes too quickly. And if it's too small, it can get stuck in a local minima. So adjusting the learning rate actually will very often give you uh, the most bang for your buck. Uh, so, and this is the Bayes opt function. And you have to create a separate objective function uh, that it will try to minimize. And that finds the best, uh, the best set of six parameters. And this is the is this is the set of uh, uh, set of parameters provided uh, by by the Bayes optimization. One other advantage of using the Bayes opt is say you're not having any luck. You want to find the best parameter space. You feed it into Bayes opt. Say it runs 15 times. It'll actually save 15 different sets of parameters that you can then when you have the low, you take you take the take the best set and you can just use that network as is. Uh, 
because it's trained that net trained the network 15 times. Right, so after doing the base optimization, if you train it, you get a 95% training accuracy. And the main parameter that was changed, and in, in this case, actually, what had happened is that it had got stuck in a local minimum. The default learning rate is 0.1, and the learning rate uh, that the base optimization found that was the best was actually closer to 0.4. Right? Uh, and the, uh, this can be a very, very valuable tool uh, for doing any sort of parameter searching, even outside of deep learning. Right, so that's the that's second approach. If you have time series data, is to use an LSTM network. Uh, it, it's designed more for sequence data, but you'll ha you can have just as much success converting to images. Uh, the other thing is in the, in the current release, we invested very, very heavily in creating lots and lots of examples. There were about 20 new examples for all different kinds of data that will show you how to use deep learning on non-image data, especially, especially sequences. So there's some sp speech recognition examples. Uh, there's sequence to sequence where you take a the input, sequ input sequ time series sequence and the output is also a time series sequence, so it's a regression problem, not a classification problem. Uh, there's text classification. Uh, and then there's examples on how you scale in computer vision, image processing. Uh, lots of very, very specific, uh, uh, specific examples for your domain. And the reason I point this out is almost always you can find an example as a starting point that is very similar to the problem that you have. Right, so again, kind of the same two points apply when you're using deep learning for signal processing. Your data preparation and pre-processing can be very crucial, and the parameter selection and the ground truth labeling, uh, in this case, the parameter selection actually is what was painful, and that can be, optim uh, that can be automated, in this case, using uh, the Bayes optimization technique. So, that, that's, that's all I have for this session. Hopefully you were able to take away that if you do have sensor data that's not image data, using your existing signal processing techniques, uh, you can really get, use deep learning and get pretty far. And MATLAB will enable you to like, automate those time-consuming tasks like the labeling uh, and parameter selection.